It's always a pleasure to speak at Hollywood Community Church. This has quickly become one of my favorite places to preach the Word of God. You all are so easy to talk to, so easy to work with. You, you let me come in with all my uh, southern mannerisms and, and don't complain one bit. I'm, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful, too, to uh, Pastor Brian, who uh, gives me these opportunities to come up and, and share a little bit of my, my passion with you all. And, and, and you know me by now. It's, you know I can never give up an opportunity. Every, every time I uh, get a chance to be in, in Pastor Brian's pulpit, it's, that's this spirit that comes over me that I just have to pick on him a little bit. But, but I'm going to tell you, though, I had a, uh, I had a revelation uh, maybe a week or so ago, and it, it was one that really made me stop and think about my, my evil ways of picking on this man. And <laughs> I, was, I was in the office uh, over here on the church side, and I began to uh, have a conversation with his assistant, Jaquetia. And um, I don't remember what the conversation was at all. I only remember that, that at the end, she had said something that I agreed with. And I heard myself say, good, 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 good. <laughs> and I, said, I said, I'm spending way too much time around this man. And it was kind of like one of those moments where everything paused and it was slow motion. Because I said the first good and I realized in, in that split of a second, another one is about to come. And the other good came out, and in between that one and the next one, I realized, oh my God, he's right next door. He's going to hear me saying this. But before I knew it, another one came out, and another one, and as soon as I stepped around the corner, before I could even open my mouth and say a thing else, he said, did you just hear yourself? <laughs> but I, I thank God. He is, he's truly my brother in the Lord, and I'm, I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be able to come and, and, and share with him. Very good friend of mine, and I have uh, been welcomed here at Hollywood Christian School and Hollywood Community Church. I love you all. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Amen. <laughs> well, we still have a, a monumental task before us this morning. For the past several months, we've been doing a series that is accurately entitled Flipped. Uh, because we have been taking a very close look at the Sermon on the Mount and the teachings that Jesus gave in this account in the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, they were very specific, uh, but they were very unique also in the way that it began to change the mindset and began to change the lives of those who were listening. And it literally flipped the way of thinking. And, and it's a scripture that I can personally relate to because it was the teachings and specifically the way he taught that transform my life as well so I can relate to this message. And so we have a, a big task before us this morning uh, as we take apart this scripture uh, that, that, we've, that we've worked with, uh, that we've chosen to work with rather. First thing we want to accomplish is we want to collate the teachings of Jesus. We want to take several places in the scriptures of his teachings and several places in the scripture of the Bible and bring them together into one point into a concise summary of what exactly Jesus taught. And, and by the way, if you, if you turn over on the back of the bulletin, you, you see that uh, there's a note section there. And, and my daughter, uh, Elisha, when we first came in this morning, she flipped it over and she looked at it. She said, Daddy, really? <laughs> I said, there, there are notes there. If, if you can't see the notes, your anointing is not strong enough. We're going to have to get you saved and delivered and set free. But being the educator I am, I do want to give you that opportunity to, to take your own notes and write down what the Spirit puts on your heart. It's going to be a good morning. It's going to be a good morning. The second thing we want to do, though, is we want to clarify the concepts of Jesus' messages. Uh, Jesus, uh, in many people's opinion, is probably one of the most misunderstood men that ever lived. And I agree with that statement. Uh, and, and because of that, his teachings have oftentimes been misunderstood especially when we take a part of what we think we know and we run with it and we build a whole belief system out of a partial truth. That's a very dangerous thing to do. So we want to clarify the concept of Jesus' teaching. And then thirdly, we want to celebrate. We want to celebrate the good news of the message of Jesus. Let's go to the Word. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 28 through 29, uh, Matthew gives us somewhat of an epilogue to the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He kind of pulls everything together in one little short, brief moment in a couple of scriptures and, and, and gives us an overview of the result of Jesus' teachings. And he says these words, And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. 
for he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so much for your word. How true it is, how powerful it is. The truth speaks for itself, your word speaks for itself. We humble ourselves before your mighty hand this morning. We make ourselves empty vessels before you. May you give us your knowledge. May you give us your wisdom. May you give us your insight and understanding. Father, don't allow my human frailties to hinder the going forth of your word, but let it accomplish that which you've sent it to do. May your name be glorified, and may Jesus be praised. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That's pretty much it. We could really go home from there. Because the scripture speaks for itself. Exegetically speaking, it's not a whole lot to work with. I mean, the scripture answers the what, the when, the how, the why. It answers everything. I mean, why were people so astonished with Jesus' teaching? Because he taught as one that had authority. How did Jesus teach? He taught as someone who had authority. So the, the scripture is clear and the word is, is, is evident. But, but if we're not careful, we miss the main thing that Matthew is trying to show us. And this is that there was something incredibly unique about the teaching of Jesus that had an everlasting effect of changing the lives of those who heard it. And what I want to do this morning is help as best I can for all of us to get in that same seat that they sat in when they heard Jesus teach. And by that I mean I want us to be in that place where we get what Jesus was trying to say, when we get what he was trying to accomplish, when we are motivated to give everything up for him just as they were, to be astonished and moved by the words of Jesus. It changed my life, and I'm not kidding. Many years ago, I, I got into ministry. I was 19 years old when I got into ministry. I grew up as a Christian. I grew up as a believer. Uh, my mom introduced me to Christ, and she kept me in church when I was a kid. I had a spat when I was a teenager, and I, I, I went from wanting to be a preacher boy to being a playboy, but, but we got over that. And, and when I came back to my senses... When I came back to my senses, I, I really could see God beginning to reveal some things in my heart. And I got into ministry when I was 19 years old and began to teach and to preach the word of God. But I'm going to tell you something. Even though I was in that position in my life and I was extremely ambitious, I was on fire for God. Nothing could stop me. I was young. I had a lot of energy. I had a lot of strength. I was handsome and just <laughs> everything, everything was in my favor. But I was missing something. I mean, I, I've been brought up in the church. I've been raised in the word. I loved it. I absolutely loved it. But, but there was still something that just wasn't there. I, I, I could repeat things that I had been taught. I could explain things that, as, as other people had explained. I could defend my faith the way I was trained to defend my faith. I could do all of that. But still, there was something that, that was missing. And, and you know, when you're in those situations like that, you start looking for that peace in all the wrong places. You know, I, I couldn't find that peace. I, I, I would talk to people who were wiser than myself. I would talk to men who were older than me. I'd talk to experienced pastors and preachers. I, I would talk to all these people saying, look, man, I, I'm, I'm on fire for God. I want to do something. I want to accomplish something. But, but I, I can't figure out what it is. Something was missing. Because I could look at what, what I know I could do and realize something just isn't lining up here. Until I really took a closer look at what Jesus was really teaching. And I really took another look at his major overall point. It completely changed my life. Now, I know you may be thinking, wow, that, that's not a very big deal. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. There's power packed in the teaching of Jesus. And, and what Matthew begins to do here in this scripture is he begins to point out the differences, the subtle differences 
between the teachings of Jesus and those of the scribes. Let's make that comparison real quick. The first thing we know about Jesus' teachings compared to the scribes is this. Jesus grew and became strong in the knowledge of God and in his wisdom. Uh, Luke records that. that There was always something about even from the time when he was young. They lost Jesus at one point. They went back and found him in the temple, and he was teaching grown men concerning the word. So ever since he was young, he had this natural, pure lineage of knowledge, wisdom, and truth. The scribes, on the other hand, prided themselves on human knowledge and traditions. In fact, it was so bad. It was so bad to the point that one time Jesus made the statement, he said that your traditions makes null the word of God. In other words, what he was saying was that you're so caught up in your way of thinking that you can no longer see the truth and the power of God's holy word. Because what you're teaching people and what you are promoting as true yourself contradicts with what God has said. So your ways of thinking is hindering you from really feeling the full effect of God's holy word. The second thing we notice about the difference between them, Jesus operated from the authority of the Father. Jesus made that statement once. He says, I cannot do anything on my own accord. But the son does whatever he sees the father do. The father was the source of his authority. The the scribes, on the other hand, were very self-righteous and people-centered. Jesus made a statement once about them. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because their righteousness, their root of authority was not based on the Father. It was based on them and trying to please people. Another thing we notice about the difference between them is that Jesus attracted others through the revelation of truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. What changed people when they heard Jesus was the way that he revealed truth. And truth is simply this. Truth is just original information. So one of the things that was so fabulous about Jesus' teaching, it's funny. All he did was he taught the way things were supposed to be. Because original is what you get when you take away stuff that's been added that should never have been there in the first place. And when you put stuff back that was taken away. You have original information. So when Jesus taught, he taught as one that's having authority because he was teaching the way God designed for it to be to begin with. He had to move through all the lies. He had to move through all the traditions. And and what had happened is the truth of God's word had been covered up in so many misconceptions, so much false teaching that people, when they finally saw it, didn't even recognize it. It's kind of like what some women do with makeup. (laughs) Women, I love you. (laughs) But I'm telling you, God did a good job on you. (laughs) You can't add to it. But I know, and I'm not talking about anybody in this room. Nobody here, so you don't have to come up to me after service. If, 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 if what I say makes you mad, you can reach me by email at brian at ourhcc.org. I'll get back to you within 15 minutes. My name is Pastor Brian Burkholder, by the way. Oh, my God. But I'm telling you, you see some women without makeup, you don't recognize them. Because you've never seen them without makeup. Hallelujah. I'm going to move on. <laughs> but that's what happened. They'd taken the word of God. They dressed it up with so much stuff that when they finally heard the unadulterated word of God, they couldn't recognize it. They didn't recognize it. Here's the last thing. Jesus taught 
concerning the kingdom, and that's going to be our main focus for today. Jesus taught concerning the kingdom. When I got that message of God's kingdom, it absolutely changed my life. It absolutely changed my life because here's what happened. When I understood the kingdom and I understood it the way Jesus taught it and the way that it's revealed in the Bible, when I came to a revelation of what the kingdom of God really is and what it's really all about, when I came to that revelation, it completely and absolutely changed my life. My purpose was defined. My vision became clear. And not only did I learn what to do, I also learned what not to do. And that saved me energy and that saved me time because now I don't get caught up in anything that does not have to do with God's kingdom. It, it don't ever call me to speak for you or to teach you or to do anything unless you want it from the kingdom. I have no interest in anything else. That's it. That, that's a, a, a picture of a light switch I have saved on my phone that, that completely explains my personality and my wife would agree. At the top of that light switch, it has uh, completely obsessed. At the bottom of the light switch, it has completely uninterested. That's how my personality is. Either I'm completely obsessed with it, or I'm completely disinterested with it. And I only want to spend my days focused on the kingdom of God. When, when I discovered that, I devoted myself to understanding what it was all about. Now, I have not arrived. I'm still learning. Every day I'm still growing. Everything, every day I'm still seeking this kingdom. Every day I'm going after those things. But it absolutely defined my life. It absolutely changed it. The scribes, on the other hand, taught traditions and they taught rules of religion. When I was listening to the intro that Pastor Brian put together, wasn't that intro powerful? Oh my God, I, I sat down on pins and needles. I was, I was getting antsy. But, but I said, I said, man, he stole my message. <laughs> He stole my message. That was powerful. Because that's, that's what it's all about. It's, it's about getting to that place where we really just sit back and listen to what Jesus said. We put all of our beliefs, all of what we've been taught, we suspend it to accept only what Jesus said. And it changes your life. Jesus said this about the scribes and their traditions. He said, you know what? He said, you go over land and sea to convert just one person. And when you finally convert that, well, that one person, he says, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are because of your traditions. And let me tell you something. My, my very first sermon I ever taught was, was Pharisees in the church. We don't ever want to get to that place where we think that we're perfect, we got it all together. Because if, if we're not careful, there are people in churches all over the world that are teaching things that are making people's lives way worse than what they have to be. They are confusing them with misconceptions. They are teaching them things that are not biblically sound. And people are believing stuff with all of their heart, their mind, and their soul that never came from God. We have to be, be careful. And we have to know what God has truly said. But here's the thing. This kingdom thing was so important to Jesus that I realized I had to make it important for me. And I had my aha moment. That's it. it, it it's subtle, yet it's so simple and profound and so deep, so true, that you can't resist it. When we look at, look at closely at what Jesus taught, even here in the the beginning of beatitude, uh, the Beatitudes. Uh, the Bible describes in Matthew chapter 3 the purpose of John, for example. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, it says this about John. It says, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. He was saying this. Look at his message. He said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Look at John's message. John was a one-hit wonder. He went about, and this is all he did. Now, he wasn't going around saying the same sentence over and over again. But what John was doing is he had a centrality to what he taught. He had a theme in the things that he taught people. And that theme that he had was concerning the kingdom of God. And he taught others concerning the kingdom. 
And, and then when you come up to Matthew chapter 4, right after that, beginning at verse 12 and 13, it says this. Now when he had heard that John had been baptized, uh, been arrested rather, referring to Jesus, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. And then verse 17 says this. From that time, from that moment there, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You got that? So John said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was teaching the kingdom. And then after he was arrested, things began to shift. And then Jesus came along, and Jesus' message was identical to John's. You know, until I understood the kingdom, I didn't quite get the point there. But one thing about a kingdom is that any time a king is coming to visit one of his territories, there are always people who go ahead of that king, and the purpose of that person is to prepare the way for the coming of the king. He goes around. He prepares the hearts and the minds of the people. He goes around and he tells them, paint this building, repave this road, build this building, do this and do that because the king is coming. Every kingdom works that way. They always send people ahead of the king to prepare the way for him. But you miss that if you don't understand the kingdom. John had a specific purpose. And once John finished his job, then in steps the king. And the king brings the same message that the one before him brought. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I could spend all day there. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. I want to show you something now. This still referring to Jesus says, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So Jesus, even when he left that place and went to Galilee, he went to Galilee for a specific reason and he began to preach a very specific message. He was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom everywhere he went. And this stuff began to pop out of the pages at me. And I realized, man, this stuff is all over the place. It's everywhere. This must be important to God. And and if it's important to God, guess what? It has to be important to me. I got to figure this out. You know, the Bible says that it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. (laughs) It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It's the glory of kings to search them out. And you know one funny thing about God is that God will hide wisdom. By the, by the, by the way, in the, in the kingdom of God, wisdom is far more valuable than money. God will take wisdom. He will take knowledge. He will take understanding. And he will hide it in the most peculiar places. It's treasure. It's valuable in the kingdom. God will take knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He'll hide it in hardship. God will take knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He'll hide it in a difficult marriage. God will take knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. He'll hide it in overwhelming sickness. Because you go to God and you pray to him and say, Father, give me strength. Give me wisdom. God says, all right, go through this. You'll have your strength. You'll have your wisdom. You'll have your understanding. Just get through this and you'll find it. I said, when you seek after me with your whole heart, You'll find me. If you want it bad enough, (laughs) you'll let go of the drugs. If you want it bad enough, you'll let go of the adulterous relationship. If you want it bad enough, you'll get rid of your love for money. If you want it bad enough, you'll do whatever it takes to get to it. So you want it, here it is. Just find it. See, we get discouraged when we go through hardship because we think hardship is just for sinful people. (laughs) Nobody but the devil wants you to think that. We think that because we're going through something hard, we're going through a a certain circumstance, that it it means that we we have to automatically be doing something wrong. Yeah, I may have done something foolish, but there's also wisdom in this. 
There's also things that God wants to encourage in my heart. We look through the teachings of Jesus, and we hear statements like, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says stuff like, blessed are those who are persecuted, for theirs also is the kingdom of heaven. This is just in one sermon, just in one sermon. He said, therefore, whoever relaxes one of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. But those who teach and do will be considered great in the kingdom of heaven. He made a statement like, your kingdom come, your will be done. If, if you don't understand the kingdom, it's easy to make that a religious statement when it's not. Because in a kingdom, a will is not a religious term. It's not just something you attach to the end of a prayer. A, a will is actually something legal in the kingdom. In a kingdom, a will refers to the expressed desires of a king. And in a kingdom, a king is a central component of the kingdom. So whenever the king expresses what's on his heart, when he expresses something that he desires, when he expresses something that he wants to accomplish, as a citizen of that kingdom, you do whatever it takes to make sure it happens. You do it for your king. You do it for his glory. You do it for his reasons. Amen? It's not a religious word. It's a legal term. So if that is so true, then this kingdom thing is important and I've got to figure it out. If I do nothing else today, that's what I have to accomplish. To get you to see just how important this message that Jesus brought is not only to us, but it's so critical to God's kingdom and who he is being glorified here on the earth. Let me start with this statement. And don't worry about the time. We're going to always be out of time. Pastor Brian tell you, Mike, you got 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Not 46, not 40, 45 minutes. I don't care if the spirit moves. <laughs> I don't care if Jesus comes. You got 45 minutes. <laughs> Father, forgive me. Oh, man. Uh, it's, it's, it's love. It's love. But you see, I'm starting to become just like him. Next week, I'll probably be white. You know? <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to tell you, the, the coolest thing about Pastor Brian, I get to see the meeting all the time. You know, the, the coolest thing about Pastor Brian that y'all don't get to see because y'all don't have that privilege is his hair. Have y'all ever seen what he does right here? Man, if, if I had hair, I would do that. <laughs> it's cool, man. I love this guy. <laughs> let, me, let me say this first. Let me say this first. And, and by the way, Brother Wilson, you're next. <laughs> he, he, he picked on me when he spoke. Oh, man. It's coming. <laughs> let me say this first. A kingdom is not a religion. A kingdom is not a religion. It's not. And let that sink in for a minute, because if you don't get that, nothing else I say is will matter. Nothing else I say will matter. A kingdom is not a religion. The tendency we have is to take everything that's discussed in the Bible, take everything that's discussed in church, and make it into a religious thing. But a kingdom is not a religion. Marinate in that for a minute. Because it makes a difference. A kingdom is not a religion. No other place except in the church do you see the kingdom of God, or the term kingdom rather, being treated like it's a religious thing. That's the only place you see that happening. Church people have the tendency to take everything and make it religious. I never forget one time that there was this, this lady uh, that was leaving the chicken restaurant. I used to run a Popeyes. And the lady was leaving this chicken restaurant and she got, got the box of chicken and, and she just threw it in the trash can. You know, being a, a, a restaurant manager, that's kind of, you want to, what's going on? Is a booger in there or something? <laughs> I can't eat that chicken. I can't eat that chicken. 
because there was a spirit on it. There was a spirit on the chicken. I said, ma'am, that's probably just smoke from the heat. <laughs> <laughs> But she couldn't eat the chicken. Mm. I don't know. So to say kingdom is not a religion, let's, let's clarify what it really is. A kingdom, I'm going to give you two definitions. One of them is a general definition. One of them is a very specific definition. General definition of the kingdom is this. A kingdom is a form of government in which a king impacts a territory with his will, his purpose, and his intentions through the influence of his citizens. Every kingdom, every effective kingdom works that way. That's what a kingdom means. It's not a religion. It's actually a form of government. Now you hear that, and some people want to run 100 miles because you say the word government. But I'm sorry, listen, it's not a religion. Neither is government a bad thing. But your poor politicians have ruined your mind and tainted your beliefs about the quality of government <laughs> that we no longer want to associate it with anything good. You mentioned the word politician and the word mistrust usually come right behind it. Or the word liar may come right behind it. There's a difference between politics and government. See, all of that stuff is getting mixed together and that's why we have to clarify these terms. But a kingdom is not a religion, it's a form of government. If we talk specifically about the kingdom of God, Here's what what, what Pastor Brian and I sat down and put our minds together and realized. The kingdom of God is the righteous, redemptive rule of God over creation and his citizens. But it's still not a religion. I don't care which way you twist it, which way you turn it. It's literally a government in which a king is impacting a territory with his will, his intentions, and his purpose. And if you don't get that, and you're calling yourself a kingdom citizen, and you're declaring yourself to be a part of this kingdom, but you're not carrying out the will of the king, you got a problem. Because in a kingdom, the king is the central component of that government. Whatever the king says becomes law. It has to happen, it has to be done. But if you are a kingdom citizen, and you have no interest in the will of the king, and you have no interest in his desires, his purpose, his intentions, you have a big problem. Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning. That's something that God doesn't put up with, and rebellion is one of them. In a kingdom, if you're not carrying out the will of the king, you're not only committing treason, but you are rebelling against that very king. So w- when you have that something comes over you that says, man, I don't feel like getting the word today. I don't, I don't feel like sitting to God in prayer today. I, I, it'll be all right. I, it'll be all right. I, I don't need to sit down and get instruction from the word today. I don't, I don't, I don't really need to go to church. I can watch church on TV. I don't, I don't really need to be a part of all this stuff right now. You're making everything else more important than the will of a king. And in a kingdom, that's illegal. This is why Jesus made the statement. He said, not everybody that says unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. But they that do the what? Will of my father. See, that's a legal statement. He said that there be those who said, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? They would not do great and mighty works in your name. And Jesus would make this statement. He would say, get away from me. I never knew you. You workers of what? Lawlessness. He said, you did all that stuff, but you never stopped to consider, is this what God wants me to be doing? Is this really his plan? Is this really his intention? Is this really what's on his heart? No, it's just what I want. See, that's living like a Pharisee. It's what I want. It's what I feel like doing. I'm going to respond in this circumstance how I feel like I need to respond. I'm going to handle it where I, need, I feel like I need to handle it. No. In a kingdom, it doesn't work that way. This is why we have to realize that when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, he was really referring to a kingdom. He really was. So I'm going to say this one more time. A kingdom is not a religion. It is not Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 says this. 
And it's referring, it's prophesying about Jesus. It's prophesying about Jesus, the, the one we call Lord, the one we call God. We, we quote this every year at Christmas. Isaiah chapter 9 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince. I did not put that there. It's been there the whole time. And when you look at Isaiah 9 and 7, it says even more. It says, of the increase of his government and of peace that would be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts would do this. Look at Psalm 145. Psalm 145 and verse 10 says this. this it's even in the songs. It says, all your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Don't let anybody fool you. Your purpose is plain. People make a big deal every time you turn around now, purpose, 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 understand your purpose. Your purpose is easy. It's easy. Don't, don't, don't buy any more books on purpose. I'm going to tell you your purpose right now. Your purpose is to influence the earth with God's kingdom. That's it. Every man on earth has the exact same purpose. Where we differ is how we function to carry out that purpose. And Paul made it plain. Some of you have a gift of teaching. So you carry out that purpose through teaching. Some of you have a gift of administration, so you carry out that purpose in administration. Some of you have a gift of giving, so you carry out that purpose in giving. But don't let anybody fool you. All of our gifts are designed to fulfill the exact same purpose. But when you make it religious, you exclude a lot of people who cannot necessarily carry out that purpose inside this building. This is why we have artists on television and in music that are sending out this poor message, messing up the minds of our kids, messing up families. You're turning your television and all kind of impurity is all over the place. Why? Because we make people feel that unless you're doing it in here, it can't be God. Because we make everything religious. But God needs kingdom-minded actors and actresses and doctors. God needs kingdom-minded politicians. But when we make everything out to be religious, we're going to exclude all of that. We're going to exclude it all. There's one more thing I just want to say. You talk about, about eschatology and all that stuff. Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, for those of you who've been wondering, not only when is he going to get to the end of this sermon, but when is the end going to come? You know, Jesus said that. Now, he said no man knows the time at all, but, but he did give us a range. He, he said this. He said, and this, in Matthew 24 and 14, and this gospel of the kingdom. And there are all kinds of gospels. There are all kinds of gospels. Turn your TV on. All kinds of gospels out there. But, but there's only one true gospel. And that is the gospel of the kingdom. When this gospel, this one, this one, he says, will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, then the end will come. My lifetime is limited here on earth. I only have so many days and so many years and so many minutes and hours to work with. And since I know my time here on earth is limited, this is what I got to do. This is why you have to seek first the kingdom of God. That word seek means to, to study, to pursue, to be preoccupied with. I only have so much time, and I know what I'm supposed to be doing, and I got to finish it before I leave here. 
Stop waiting to do the thing that you already know that God has called you to do. Now is the time. Now is the time. I want to give you 10 quick thoughts about this message that Jesus taught because it's important. Real quick, here's 10 things I want you to put in your mind. The first one is this. God is a righteous king. He rules over a kingdom of righteousness. He is king. Not Mike, not Brian, anybody. He is king. Second thing is this. We were created to live and have our being in him to carry out the will of that king. Third thing, apart from him, we can do nothing. Here's the fourth one. Sin separates us from that king. We got a problem because we've just established I I can't do anything apart from him. I can't live without him. I have to accomplish his will because that's how kingdoms work. That's how kingdoms function and operate. If I'm not fulfilling the will of the king, I'm not a part of that kingdom. I'm not. If I'm not doing his will, my sin will keep me from doing his will. Here's the fifth thing. Separation from the king always leads to death. Always. Sixth thing, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. It is impossible for us on our own to re-enter the kingdom. You know what that means? That means that every religion would fail because religion is man's attempt to get to God. He sets up ideologies, he sets up systems, he sets up beliefs, and he thinks that those beliefs are going to get him to where he wants to go. It's going to fail. It's impossible. Seventh thing, the presence of Christ on earth indicated the king and his kingdom had come to us. Number eight, the death of the king paid the penalty for our sin. Number nine, his resurrection gave us life, gave us access to this new life. And here's the 10th thing, by being born again, because you only get citizenship in a kingdom by birth. You, you can't be naturalized as a citizen in the kingdom of God. If you've ever gone through an immigration process, you know what I mean. You cannot become a naturalized citizen in a kingdom. The only way you become a citizen of a kingdom is through birth. You have to be born into the kingdom. So you have a problem because you weren't born as a citizen of this kingdom. So the only way to solve this problem is that you have to be what? Born again. And when you are born again, you're born into a new life. And that new life gives you access to the king of your life. And by that, you're able to live and move and have your being. Paul said this in Romans chapter 10, and I'm almost done. He said this in Romans chapter 10. He said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, when the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, here's the real reason why I point that scripture out. I, I know I'm pressed for time. If, if you got to go get your chicken, go get your chicken. But, but this is important. It's easy to confess with your mouth. I can say things with my mouth that I don't necessarily believe. But here's where some of us have made the mistake, and, and, and we've taken the grace gospel which is the wrong gospel. It's when people take the part of salvation that they like and they run with it. Yes, I've been saved. Yes, I've been redeemed. But but there's more to it than that. When you take a part of the gospel, when you take a part of the message and you run it and you treat it like that's all that there is, you're going to have problems. And that's what people have done with grace. They've taken grace and they've run with it. This is it. I got it all figured out. No, you don't. So we believe that if we just say it, I'm saved. I believe in Jesus. If we just say it, we think that that's it. But but there's the word and there. That's a conjunction. It means that the two clauses of that sentence are connected. So you can't have one without the other. It's easy to confess with your mouth. 
but do I really believe it in my heart? Because belief is not just agreeing with something, but belief is an internalized conviction that, transform, that transforms the mind, the will, and even the intellect of an individual. Amen. We've confessed it with our mouths, but do we truly believe it in our heart? Here's the final thoughts. Do you really believe in your heart, the very core of your subconscious? Do you really believe it there? Secondly, do you continually seek? And I use the word continually, not continuous. Continuous means there's a start and a stop and a start and a stop. But continually means I do it and I'm going to keep on doing it. Do you continually seek to fulfill his will? Do your actions aligned with the heart and the word of the king? And I'm not asking you, are you perfect? I don't care how much of a kingdom citizen you are, you're never perfect. And kingdom citizen doesn't make you perfect. But I'm asking you, are you progressing? Not perfection, but progression. Am I growing? Because growth is always an indication of life. When something is not growing, it is dying. So I'm not asking you, are you perfect? I'm asking you, are you progressing? Fourthly, do you love him? You remember when Jesus asked Peter that question? It's an annoying question. Because you almost want to reply, of course I do. Do you love him? But then you followed up with this fifth question. Do you obey him? Because if we're not obeying our king, if we're not aligning our heart and our mind and our will with what's on his heart, and what's on his mind, then we're serving the wrong kingdom. There are two kingdoms in this world. There's a kingdom of light, and there's a kingdom of darkness. And you can't serve both. Either you're gonna love the one and hate the other, but you can't serve both. You can't have them both at the same time. Which one are you loyal to? Which one do your actions and the very seat of your heart Reveal that you are a part of. I'm, I'm talking about the parts of you that you can hide from man, but you can't hide them from God. Because God says, I, even I am he. Who searches the hearts and the reins of men. And so God says, I know what's there. You know what's there. Do you really believe? Do you really but here's the good thing about God. He doesn't come to you. He doesn't jack you upside the wall and say, you had better do it. He didn't do that. It's not how he operates. But he comes to you and he says, guess what? In spite of it all, I still love you. In spite of it all, I still want you. In spite of it all, you're still valuable. To me. He says, all you have to do is trust me and obey, and we can make this right. I love the conversation that he had with the prophet Isaiah. He said, Isaiah, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be like scarlet, you shall be white as snow. He said, come on, come here. Come on, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. Let's talk about this. I know you've messed up. I know you've made mistakes. I, I know you've gotten it wrong a lot of times. He says, I've, I've watched you trying to get to me on your own, under your own power, by your own might. I've watched you fail over and over and over again. Stop. Come to me. And I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As our worship team comes back up this morning, I want to encourage you. There are some doors in your heart that the word of man cannot open. 
There are some places in your heart that can only be opened from the inside. I want to encourage you that if you've never really given God access to all, that, all those doors, that now is the time. Now is the time. I need you. You need me. We're all a part of this. We're all a part of God's plan. Everything, give it to him. They sing that song, my heart is yours. Give it all. They sing that song, I surrender. Surrender completely. And give everything to him.